to this Sunday following Easter. The disciples were still wondering in dismay. They were scattered. They were not sure what was going on. They were beginning to hope but struggling. And this morning we especially look at the story of Thomas who was doubting. Alfred Lloyd, Lord Tennyson said, there is more faith in honest doubt than in half the creeds. I think we need to remember that doubting is part of faith just as joy is part of sadness. They go together. Would you join with me in the call to worship in the bulletin? Our theme this Easter season is coming to life, and this morning we are talking about how that life is revealed. How do we come to know it? Life is revealed when you are Christ and you are our fear, our God, and you Life is revealed when we recognize the resurrection of Christ and hear the words of peace. Life is revealed when we believe and say with promise, our Lord and our God. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us pray. Come to us, God. Open our locked doors and hearts just like you did to those early disciples. Dust us off and make us new. Lead us with all our questionings and wonderings into the exciting mystery, mysteries of discipleship. We long to be your Easter people, to live and proclaim new life with all our being. Amen. Stand and sing an Easter hymn number 283. 283. Christ who left his home in glory.
133 talks about the wonder of relationships and unity. And there are many times when we are experience disunity, and that's very wearing. And this psalm talks about the healing, the refreshment that comes when people are in unity. And uh, it talks about healing oil. One time it talks about Aaron. Aaron was the priest of God's people, so as a father figure, he would have especially um, thought about how important it was for unity. Psalm 133. How good it is when brothers and sisters live in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, poured down on Aaron's beard, running down his beard and onto the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. What a blessing it is when God brings us together in unity. We're privileged this morning to have Lindsay with us to share with us music.
before and after our scriptures, we are singing number 283. It will be on the screen. You can see the words there if you want to turn to the music. 273. Okay. No, 270. 270. Okay. If you want the music. We will sing this song. There will be a drama. I will read the scripture and we will sing it again. So, be prepared. <coughs> I told you they were after us. Temple guards are combing the city, looking for us. That's just a rumor that Philip heard. It may be true. I say we just calm down. Call the other disciples to meet us in the upper room, and then decide together what to do. No. If they find us together, they'll arrest us. All of us. We need to split up. I've seen him. I've seen the Lord. You found his body? Where? No, I've seen him. Jesus is alive. I saw him and talked to him. Listen, after you left, I looked inside the tomb one more time. There were two people in there dressed in white. They spoke to me, but I had this sense that someone was behind me. So I stood. But he wasn't. It was Jesus, Jesus himself. Wait a minute. If it was Jesus, why didn't you recognize him? I don't know. He looked the same. He looked normal. But for some reason, I didn't recognize him until he called my name. He said, Mary. And then I saw it was Jesus. He's alive. I talked to him. I touched him. What did he say? He said to tell you that he is going to be with his father. He's going to be with God. But first, he wants to see you, all of you. Mary, are you sure? Are you sure it was Jesus? It was Jesus. I know who Jesus is. I know my Lord. You heard her. Jesus wants to see all of us. We do need to come together in the upper room. That's where Jesus will look for us. I'm going now. I'm going to tell everyone to meet us there. You really did see him, didn't you? I know he talked about rising from the dead, but it never made any sense. It still doesn't make sense. Everything that's happened since Thursday night. Peter, are you still thinking about Thursday night? You don't seem very excited about what I said. You look worried. I'm thinking about something Jesus said once. He said that one day he would come back. He would come back with God's angels. He said that anyone who had denied him, he would deny on that day. I wonder if this is that day. I wonder if he's coming back to deny me before God. I wonder if he's coming back to condemn anyone who ever denied him. story from John 20. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and he stood among them and said, peace be with you. 
as he said them, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so now I am sending you. And with that he breathed on to them the Holy Spirit and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone, they, their sins will be forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they will not be forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, who was one of the twelve, was not with disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hands in his side, I will not believe it. Well, a week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came again and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? And reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting, but believe. Then Thomas said, My Lord, Then Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Well, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God that believing you might have life in his name. several guest speakers this morning. The voice you will hear, such as it is with a bad cold, is mine. But most of the words and stories you will hear belong to our guest speakers. I sent out an email to a lot of people here at First Mennonite a couple weeks ago and again the beginning of this week. And I invited people to respond to the question, what made you believe? And I was asking, you know, what person, what situation, what revelation from God, what, what experience moved you at least a step along the journey from, from doubt, which is where Thomas was, toward faith and belief. I got 11 responses for which I'm thankful, and those responses form the core of my message today. I want to say first of all that belief is a journey. I didn't choose my sermon title by accident, The Journey to Belief. Belief is not something you get and then have. Belief is not something that you possess in uh, perfect totality. 
And that's because the Christian life, if it's alive, is dynamic. There's always a process of change and rethinking and doubt and questioning and growth. Now we can say, I believe, and we can mean it. We can say, as Thomas did, my Lord and my God. But that doesn't mean that our belief can't, can't deepen, can't be challenged, can't be reframed, can't grow. You know, if, um, if faith and belief are not growing and developing, then all you have is sort of a rigid, stagnant, deadening religion. And that's not what we're after. So the people who have shared with me and allowed me to share their journey with you are not claiming to have it all together. They have made forward steps on their journey to belief. I will not be using any names, and in fact, I've done a fair amount of editing of what people sent me. I've edited for brevity in some cases. I said a hundred words or less, and not everybody listened. <clears throat> or for clarity, or to take out details that I thought would be distracting. So these aren't exactly verbatim, but they're close. And as I read these testimonies, I want you to listen. I want you to listen for, for themes. Listen for the keys to new growth. How did it happen? What is it that happened in this person's life that helped them take a step on the journey from doubt to faith? Here's the first one. My first belief that there was a God and that prayers could be answered was when I was five or six years old. I was in Bible school and it was raining. My teacher, an older lady, had us pray for sunshine. It happened. And we saw God's promise, a rainbow. We thank God for answering our prayers. Our teacher to me seemed so holy. She was soft-spoken and left a real impression on me. And this person also goes on to write this. My belief in Christ has become stronger as I look back and see how my life is like a puzzle that all fits together to make the person who I am that God created. My faith has become stronger when I look back at my past and see how God's timing has allowed doors of opportunity to open in my life, which then lead to other doors of opportunity. A lot of times the opportunities are least expected. Here's person number two. I can't remember not believing in God. I learned to believe from my parents, especially my mother, and my church experiences. I never really knew what faith my father had. I worried about him, and I prayed for him. That all changed when he died. Dad's spirit left his body. I skipped a sentence. That all changed when he died. My family was at his bedside. The pastor walked in and started to pray. Dad's spirit left his body, and we all felt a holy presence fill the room. I cannot describe the love and joy felt from that loving presence. But I will not doubt again, because I felt the love of God that day. And I know my Father is in his loving hands. Person number three writes, Briefly, I always believed what made Jesus alive to me was meeting God in imaging prayer. The Spirit makes Jesus very real to me in this way. Person number four, the more I got into the scriptures, the deeper my relationship with Jesus became. 
When I decided to believe in God, I also had to decide to follow his ways. What I do shows what I believe. In Isaiah 43, I have the assurance that I don't go through difficult times and circumstances alone. That I take the hand of him who made those promises to me, and it is fulfilled by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's another, person number five. What made me believe was a wonderful Bible school teacher who was very kind, a very kind, soft-spoken woman who explained what Jesus went through for us and what it means to believe, basically the whole Easter story. I was in about fifth grade, as I remember. It was then in the playground that one of my friends and I were moved by what she said, and we decided to, to go back into the classroom and to accept Jesus as our Savior. Each person needs to make a verbal commitment at some time in their life. It is not something that we simply acquire because we always went to church or because we grew up in a Christian home. At some time, we need to say for ourselves, yes, 